so let me tell you about Michael and uh, not delay any further. Um, I think he needs no introduction, but the introduction I have in front of me is so impressive I, I just have to share it with you. Uh, Michael Corin is the host of the nightly Michael Corin show, which airs on CTS television. Um, he's uh, a, uh, a syndicated columnist uh, published every Saturday with the Toronto, Ottawa, Calgary, Edmonton and Winnipeg Sun with the London Free Press. Uh, more than a dozen other daily and weekly newspapers uh, across Canada. He's also a columnist for Women's Post, the Catholic Register, the Landowner and the Interim. Uh, he's also a publisher. Uh, he has written and published uh, more than, than uh, 12 books actually exactly 12 books, uh, including biographies of G.K. Uh, Chesterton, H.G. Wells, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, my favorite, J.R.R. Tolkien, and, and C.S. Lewis. Uh, he's contributed to the Dictionary of National Biography and several other anthologies. He's received uh, honorary doctorates and several awards for his work in broadcast and television. Uh, in 2005, he won the Edmaro Award for Radio Broadcasting. In 2006, the RTNDA Radio Broadcasting Award, in 2007 the Communicator Award in Hollywood, and in 2008 the Omni Award for his television show. Um, on a personal note, the first time I showed up on the Michael Corrin show, uh, I was in the hot seat. It was about the, uh, the Pope's comments uh, uh, back in, this was 2007, 2008, uh, and I learned something very quickly, uh, and this is what attracted me to this show and ma makes me appreciate uh, Michael Corrin and his show, uh, and this particular panel, Faith Matters. Um, Michael uh, does two things that I haven't seen any other television show in Canada do. Uh, he brings a diversity of voices, uh, which for a community like mine is, is very important, uh, because no single person can ever claim to speak for an entire community. And Michael does this very well as he brings diverse voices to show you the spectrum of ideas that are out there. And we get into issues in a more sophisticated way than we have a chance elsewhere. But the second thing that he does is, regardless of whether he agrees with you or disagrees with you, he will not let you get away with platitudes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I hope you get a sample of this. Um, you know, a few months ago, Father Penna, who's from Edmonton, who I had an opportunity to be with us in person, and at the conclusion of the show, he was very excited. And he said, brothers, we should take this show on the road. Yes. And so this, hopefully, is the first of a series of road shows of Faith Matters. With that, and without further ado, Michael Corrin. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, we won't spend too long on this. We want to get to the fun bits, which is usually the audience participation uh, what Faith Matters is, every, every two weeks on the television show, uh, we have a panel called Faith Matters. We, we, it's a current affairs show, so we discuss all sorts of issues. Um, uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday are general debate shows, and uh, Tuesday and Thursday are devoted to other issues. Every two weeks we have federal politics, arts and culture, foreign affairs, and one is called Faith Matters. And we assemble people, it, it sounds a bit like a joke, you know, an uh, evangelical, Catholic, a Jew, a Muslim, atheist, walk into a TV <laughs> studio together, and, um, and sometimes it can be quite amusing, but we discuss issues, and uh, what I've always been, dead, I don't want to sound too grand or pretenders here, but what I've always been devoted to in TV, because frankly I think most Canadian TV is incredibly boring, um, it, it's just freedom of expression. That doesn't mean everyone is welcome, because some people are too stupid, actually. On TV, but generally speaking, all opinions will be welcome and an open discussion of those and allow people to make up their own minds. So most people know what is uh, what is true and what is right and what is wrong and what is what is lies. Uh, we have a group of, of uh, seven or eight people, I suppose, who who come on to the show. We have a couple of people uh, who represent the Catholic point of view, uh, a couple of the evangelical, uh, a couple of Muslim, and uh, Justin will introduce in a few moments. He's invariably the atheist. And um, he's, a, you know, he's a very brave young man, I have to admit, because he knows he's always going to be uh, bullied by the rest of the team, and he still comes back. So bullied by like you, Mike. Well, yes. Uh, either very brave or very dim, but uh, I, I, I go for, for, for very brave. <laughs> so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to take a couple of questions, we're going to discuss them ourselves. That's really just to warm you up. And after that, I'd like you to put your hands up and ask a question. And I know it's a bit intimidating to be the first one to put their hand up, uh, but it really is it's a, a small crowd and uh, nobody's out of place here. So any question you have, and then we'll discuss it. 
as a group of people together. So I'll just briefly introduce people, and then I'd like them to take it just a minute, if they would, to say a bit about uh, who they are, what they are, who they represent. Um, we'll, we'll go uh, from left to right. I mentioned Justin Trottier, Executive Director, Center for Inquiry, uh, which I always say on the show is a secular humanist organization, but you've got about 40 seconds to defend yourself, Justin. This is where I try to come up with a witty one-liner to encapsulate the broadness of CFI, but uh, you do a pretty good job, actually. It, it is hard to encapsulate without just naming labels, uh, which is unfortunately what people like to do. But we are often secular humanists. Some of us are skeptics of different uh, different sorts, often skeptics of religious claims, uh, free thinkers. You've often heard those terms, and invariably, m m many of us, if not all of us, tend to be atheists and, and or agnostics. So you can use any of those labels tonight. I'm quite comfortable defending any of them. Thanks. Mm, the plot thickens. <laughs> Father Stefano Pena, Dean of Newman Theological College in uh, Edmonton, isn't it? Yes, it is. the center of the universe, and we're glad to be at the place where all our gas is cheaper than it is in the place where we produce it. Uh, I've been a priest for 25 years, a Roman Catholic priest, uh, trained in Toronto, Saskatoon, Rome, the Gregorian University, and at Yale University of Philosophy and Religion. You know how you can tell if someone's studied at Yale? You don't, they tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Saskatoon and Yale. <laughs> Andy Bannister, uh, lead apologist, that doesn't mean saying sorry. Uh, Ravi Zacharias, <laughs> international minister, he, he, he won't go into details on this, but Ravi Zacharias, uh, Ravi um, is a, a Christian from, from South Asia, from India, who is one of the, the finest minds I've encountered in, in, over the past 20 years, actually, of uh, debate and discussion. Uh, a quite marvelous man, and he has organizations in various countries. And um, Andy, who is from another country originally, and a very fine one, is the Canadian uh, representative of that organization. Yeah, I'll give you 30 seconds to work out which country I'm from uh, by my accent. I'm a recent arrival here on your shores. My wife and I moved to Toronto from Oxford uh, about seven months ago. And we were enjoying it until about September when it began to get cold, and then November when it snowed. When it first snowed, my wife got very excited, and then the next door neighbour said, yes, just wait six weeks, and then it will have worn off. I am, as Michael said, an apologist. He stole my one joke, which is going to be when I told friends in England I was coming here to work as an apologist. They said, oh, are you going to spend your time apologising for the Canadians? And I said, no, they can apologise for themselves. And they quite well. Basically, an apologist means I spend my time travelling around your wonderful country and the world answering questions about faith. Um, Ravi, who, uh, who Michael did a wonderful job of, of, of introducing, um, who set our organization up, summed us up nicely. He said the role uh, uh, of RZIM is to help the thinker believe and to help the believer think. Mm. Now, Rabbi Dan uh, Salzburg, Beth Jacob Synagogue in Hamilton, and we've not met before. And we haven't met before. I'm getting old. I'm 52 on Saturday. I have to check. I haven't met you before. Uh, but has not been on the show, so you're a little bit of a disadvantage, or maybe a huge advantage. But do go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I am also from another country, more adjacent to this one, and I won't apologize for it. The <laughs> <laughs> Quebec. <laughs> you can tell me that. <laughs> I, uh, I grew up in Wisconsin and moved here from Los Angeles where, again, the weather is just not like this, uh, where I was trained as a rabbi at what's now the American Jewish University in the conservative stream of Judaism, which is, uh, for those who like spectrum uh, definitions, uh, the center of the Jewish religious spectrum. Uh, for many of the things outside of the atheist tag, though some of those, uh, our congregation here in Hamilton has a lot of uh, what was mentioned initially, free thinkers and skeptics and people questioning and the like, and that uh, much of that is part of the Jewish tradition and is actively practiced uh, here at Beth Jacob as it is in synagogues around town and around the world. And, there's a joke, but I'm not going to make it. Lastly, uh, Dr. Yasser Hadera, board member of the Muslim Association of Canada. Um, I I'll take the risk of uh, being all schmaltzy here, but uh, it really is a pleasure to know you. Uh, you've taught me a great deal past a couple of years you've been on the show, and I, I also uh, take the liberty of saying I think you do a magnificent job in representing your faith, uh, moderately and intelligently. And, um, and let me say this as someone who, who is a, a, a strong, proud 
Roman Catholic who is prepared to speak what I believe to be the truth even when it offends people. Um, I'm a little bit tired of the Muslim voice on Canadian TV being one of two people, and I think you know who I mean, over and over again. It, it, it's anti-intellectual uh, to, to have people on Canadian TV speaking about the Muslim faith and effectively or implicitly representing the Muslim faith who don't speak or read Arabic or Urdu or Turkish or Farsi. It's simply insulting to any thinking person. So thank you, Ms. Thank God. Uh, for, for people like uh, Yasser. Go ahead, Yasser. Brief introduction of yourself. Thank you so much. Um, I, uh, I, I already had my chance, so I won't say a lot more, but uh, uh, I, I, I think I trump uh, the folks from another country because I'm from three other countries. <laughs> um, I was born in the States, so I'm an American, uh, and I, I don't apologize for that either. <laughs> uh, um, I'm Egyptian uh, by, by lineage and heritage. And when we first immigrated to Canada, we actually landed in Newfoundland, which does count as a separate country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you probably know this, but in Newfoundland, when people come from other places, the idea is they will stay in Newfoundland. It's a way to increase the population. They seldom do. Mm -hmm. well, I don't know. Why can't stay there for 24 years? 24 years? That's not the thing. That's probably a record, actually. It's <laughs> not to be in any way critical. Let's move on. Um, <laughs> exactly. Oh, the, 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 the first. Although, I don't know if you heard this, the, the, uh, the Dire Straits song, Money for Nothing, mm. the one complaint that got taken off yes. the came from Newfoundland. Yes. We need to find this, uh, this person. We discussed various issues on the show today, it's uh, already aired actually, but uh, and it's a controversial one, but I think it's a very good one to discuss in terms of, we're not here to be ecumenical, I, I, I'm, I, I actually don't like the word ecumenical, it tends to mean everyone <coughs> watering down their ideas at the same time. Uh, I, I believe in having ideas, disagreeing, but leaving the room as friends. So that, that's, that's what I believe it is. But this is the issue of, of coexistence of religions in the Muslim world. And I think that inevitably lead, leads to, to, to the Muslim on the panel feeling perhaps that he has to defend against other people. But I don't think it need be that. This is about uh, humanity progressing with differences. But we have had, of course, uh, recently uh, some terrible incidents. We had the Roman Catholic Church in, in Iraq, 51 people were, uh, were murdered. We, we had the attack in Alexandria. We had another group of Christians killed on a train by a, an Egyptian police officer. Uh, we've had the governor of, uh, of a province, a state in Pakistan, being assassinated and, and uh, a mass celebration of that killing because he opposed the blasphemy law. We have now two people sentenced to death for blasphemy in, in Pakistan. No one's been executed for blasphemy in Pakistan. People have been lynched by the mob, but they haven't been officially executed. It should be noted, by the way, that the majority of people sentenced to death of blasphemy in Pakistan are Muslim. Some people assume it's an anti-Christian crusade. Uh, a large, considering how few Christians there are in Pakistan, a large number of the people sentenced to death of blasphemy are Christian, but the vast majority are Muslim. The third group would be, would be Hindu. But there does seem to be a problem of pluralism and coexistence for non-Muslims in many Muslim-majority countries. Now, we discussed this earlier today, so some of these ideas, um, so we've already gone over them, but I think it's a good place to start. Yes, sir. So again, I mean, it feels like uh, going through the same, uh, the same uh, covering the same ground again, to a certain extent, but uh, uh, the reality of the matter is that uh, in today we are facing I say we, I mean human beings in general, decent human beings, whatever we are, we are facing a trend uh, of uh, an extremist uh, group, sometimes not an organized group as such, but an intellectual, if, you, if we can call it that trend, that holds itself to have the answers for everything. Um, and, uh, and they consider that they have the right to adjudicate the, faith, the fate uh, as well as the faith of other people. Um, and I mentioned the example of Iraq where the violence that came through there was first directed at other Muslims, not even other sectarian you know, Muslims. It wasn't, it wasn't even sectarian violence to begin with. It was directed at people from the same sect, supposedly, or the same type or kind of Muslim, if you will, just people that disagreed, people that had more moderate voices. Those, those people were the first people targeted with this violence and targeted with assassinations. And then it progressed from there and it, it uh, this, this, this campaign 
to attack people in their places of worship, to attack people during uh, seasons that were holy to them and for them. And, and uh, to be, you know, I come from Egypt, as I mentioned, when these events happened in Egypt, I was shocked. Um, and uh, I, had, I had conversations with some of my Christian friends, and, and one person told me, you know, why are you shocked? You know, we've, we've seen this tension, we've seen this increasing polarization around religious language, and this is the inevitable result. I hope that he's wrong, uh, but, but certainly the events that we've seen uh, don't, don't bode well. Um, and I, I think that we all have a duty to counter that in terms of our discourse. We have to come back to the fundamental value of human dignity. We cannot hope to resolve this kind of trend by coming to an agreement about theology. We cannot hope, this can't be the approach that if we can just all see eye to eye, then there will be peace and love everywhere. We have to figure out how to live together through our respect for our for fundam fundamental respect for human dignity, um, even though we disagree and we will continue to disagree. The trends, though, are not encouraging. If these were aberrations, if there were one or two countries with a problem, one or two regions, um, but Pakistan, for example, there was a period in Pakistan where the political class, like the political class was still dominant and had mass support and fundamentalism was, was very small and very contained. It seems now the equation has been reversed. In fact, the political class, those who actually do believe in a, in a, in a jinnah like Pakistan, a, a genuine, I mean, Karachi was a city with, with many Christians, uh, where, well, though there were hardly any Jews, but the, the, the idea of, of, of Jewish people was respected, almost revered. That's changed fundamentally in the past 50 to 20 years. And it looks like it's going to get worse. And Pakistani Christians feel, I think perhaps more than anywhere even in the Arab world, they feel they, they have very little future in that country. Yeah, I mean, I, again, we have to pref I have to preface this by saying I can't really speak in detail with, with knowledge about the politics of any one country, except possibly you know, Egypt, Canada, and the States. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but uh, in general, uh, one thing that it, you know, it's difficult to see hope in this, but I, but I do. One thing that we should note is that this is not tied to a religion as much as it is tied to places where there is political instability. Uh, these trends are increasing in the presence of certain political conflicts, in whether it is in Pakistan or whether it is in Iraq or whether it is in Egypt. These are three different places with three different problems. But what we are seeing as at the core of this is a fundamentally political and violent and exclusivist ideology. Uh, the role of faith in this um, is often at a cover. Uh, people, people who are angry, people who are uh, hateful, will use whatever tools are at their disposal to articulate and to clothe their ideology. And in these particular places, they are using faith. Now, that does not absolve people of faith from our faults and our negligence in speaking clearly uh, and openly about issues of discrimination and about religious tension. And that is, that is something that has to be done, and that is what I see hope for the future. But really, if you look at the places where the most egregious crimes are happening, it is places where there is political instability, and there are these violent, exclusivist groups that are trying to push through uh, these political agendas. And I mentioned for Egypt, I know and for a fact that in Egypt, a big part of the problem is the role of the regime. That the, 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 you have an oppressive regime that's been in power for over 30 years, is trying to hang on to power desperately. And they do, uh, they do push uh, these religious tensions. I'm not saying they created them, but they manipulate them, they exploit them, and, and, and this, is, this is the result. But one of, and, and one of the problems, if I might, mm -hmm. has been, um, is the great diaspora of a traditional, historically established community. Christians have had a strong presence in many places, in many countries in the Middle East. My first encounter with that <coughs> diaspora was those Iraqi Christians Chaldean great Christians who speak Aramaic, uh, still the language of Jesus, still one of the most ancient languages, cult established in Mosul, the area of ancient Nineveh, who were displaced by the policy supported at that time by the United States of Saddam Hussein to destroy all of their towns because this was in the buffer area with Kurdistan. And so you have this great inrush of Iraqis that has led to, in the last 30 years, the percentage of Catholics and Christians in Iraq going from one in five to one in 30, you know, and this has been a devastating, I think, kind of part in the, uh, of the experience there. And the problem is, is that 
Though, of course, there is tension between all the various groups and, and expressions, the Christians become the common other. In other words, that of the, in the discussion, the people who are right at hand are the Christians. And when you throw in the uh, Western militarization of this area, they begin to look like something that I don't think they are, namely a fifth column. And in some people's experience and expression, I mean, I, I've been struggling with it ever since my, these Iraqis came to me and said, you be, I'll be honest with you, they said, you be very careful about letting Muslims into your country. We let them in 700 years ago, you know, like, at, at the year 700, and it's been disastrous. And that, so I'm sensing there's history beyond which I can understand. So how do we respond in such a way? My issue is here. How do we model the kind of plurality and discourse that allows people to have a place here? Because I think one of the things is there's no room for religious people to actually have that kind of discussion that allows there to be a reasonable exploration. And I think that's because of the increasing secularism, the, the if you will, the quasi-religious uh, commitment of Canadian society and Canadian, at least those the intelligentsia to a kind of a secularism that just sort of makes peripheral all of these kind of religious discussions. I want to add, one thing before we hear from, uh, from Justin. Uh, what I've noticed increasingly in, in Palestine and Palestinian territories, and it's a good example here, because anyone who knows the history of Israel-Palestine will know that the Palestinian narrative was really explained, given to the West by Palestinian Christians. Uh, overwhelmingly Greek Orthodox Christians, who were the most uh, nationalistic of Palestinians, often regarded as being more nationalistic than most Muslims. We think of George Bash, founded the PFLP, and so on, but there are many others. Uh, it, it was seldom Catholic. It's a, it's a different story. Greek Orthodox Palestinians who came to, the, to Europe in the 19th century, who brought back the ideas of nationalism, sadly also brought back some ideas of anti-Semitism. It's a European concept that was taken to the Middle East. But they, they were at the very center of what was profoundly a secular Palestinian movement. Now, it would be wrong, as some in the United States argue now, that it's, it's held for Christians in, in Palestine. That's not true. But I have noticed an increasing, I suppose, resignation on the part of Palestinian Christians, many at least, that there's simply no future for us. Because as much as, as Israel and occupation and so on may destabilize a region, when a job is denied you, even though you are highly qualified and highly educated, because you're a Christian and the person who done your job is not an Israeli but it's a Muslim, when the job goes to a Muslim rather than to a Christian, and we can deny as much as we want, this is a daily reality, this simply could not, could not have happened in any Palestinian town or city 20 years ago. And it is happening now. And it, it's very sad to say people who feel betrayed on both sides. Right, absolutely, but I think it's very dangerous, sorry, you guys can, but I think it is very dangerous to see a trend uh, in, in these changes, uh, I, I think uh, I, I think if we look if we look at a little bit a longer timeline, we see that a correlate you know theology and these thing these attitudes do not correlate very well. And I think you mentioned the example of Iraq, and Saddam Hussein was again a brutal dictator, and his his worst violence was not directed at uh, uh, Christians or even. Uh, Shia, you know, because he came from a Sunni background here. I mean, this man was not motivated by faith. This no. man was a secular. Yeah, yeah, you know. But his worst, his worst violence was against his own co-religionists. Yeah. It was uh, Kurds because they were in the way. You know, and sure. this is so, so. And we have, and we have to really understand that this is the, when we see these trends. Uh, the issue here is not faith. The issue sometimes is is the the hijacking of the language of faith. Mm -hmm by people who want to push well, certain agenda. Let's ask Justin that. Is it, Justin, is this inevitable, typical of religion at some point in its evolution? Well, I think religion isn't the only thing to blame, but I think it does make matters worse. I think when you can point to divine authority to justify uh, your political power and your political structure, as we were talking about on the show today, I think that lends a legitimacy that you wouldn't otherwise be able to grasp that. <laughs> I'm glad that, uh, that you've both uh, jumped from Egypt to, say, Palestine, and from just focusing on the plight of Christians to that of other minority groups, I think it's a really important point to make that even if religion isn't the, sort, the only source of the problem, I think that a, a secular political system coupled with um, uh, freedom of expression above all 
uh, and, a, and a tolerance, a, 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 not a superficial one, but a, a, a deep tolerance for minority groups and minority positions within the, the majority Muslim community in most cases. I think that's the most important uh, way forward to solve some of these problems. Speaking of Palestine, the Palestinian Authority late in 2010 arrested a blogger who had made comments, um, I'm not sure if he said out and out that he was an atheist, but they were certainly very critical of religion. Um, and apparently he's now being kept under arrest for fear of repercussions. This is their pretext that might happen to him should he be released. So I just want to make it very clear, I don't think this is just a, a problem for, for Muslim groups or for Christian groups. I don't think it's limited uh, to the, the country of Egypt. Uh, I do have to uh, disagree with the point uh, that Yasser uh, had made to open this, uh, this uh, train of thought, that if you look at the, the common factors across the countries in the Middle East, where these kinds of abuses are taking place, where people are fearing for their life when they engage in this, in my opinion, non-existent sin of so-called blasphemy, it is the countries that are overwhelmingly using a theocratic uh, Sharia form of, of law to justify their actions. It's not the more secular countries, uh, such as Turkey and other more secular Muslim countries, where we're seeing the rates of abuse that we are in places like Egypt or Saudi Arabia or Iran. Yes. Uh, Rabbi, if I may, because if anyone has a collective experience and dark history of, of, uh, of living with, uh, with majorities and, and, and not always being treated, or actually generally not being treated very well by them, it, it's the Jewish people. There must be some echoes, I think, of, of Jewish history and what Christians are facing now in large parts of the Muslim world. So, Jews obviously, as you mentioned, lived as, uh, as minorities in, under Muslims and Christians for centuries, and I would say the best times came, like I was just said, um, with the advent of secular rule between the fall of the Roman Empire and 1776. Jews weren't full citizens of any country. They were in Rome, and they were in America, unindependent, but not between them, and then in France, and then slowly across Europe. And the status of Jews and the freedom of Jews and the security of Jews indeed increased with the advent of secular regimes or regimes that, uh, that felt a, uh, a constitutional responsibility. Uh, and I mean, there's, no, there's no denying the common denominator in many of these places that have recently seen actions against their religious minorities, that it's regimes without such responsibilities, uh, be it in, uh, in Egypt or in Iraq. These are places where either the regimes are shaky and desperately holding out to power, and in the case of Egypt, I'm sort of worried what will happen when they bubble over, and I, for one, am fairly terrified of what will happen. This may be a golden age. In five years, it might be much worse once. A lot of the tensions that are causing these, because they're not government grounds, they are under the surface. Once those come to, if those come to the surface, it could be much worse. And something. The one thing that the government lets it happen is that the government can't stop it anymore. It's coming from the people underneath. Mm -hmm. oh, we, we could construe from what you said that um, the less religion, the better it is for minorities. Not necessarily the less religion, <laughs> but the more religion is, feels somewhat constrained or, I mean, it, it's born of the born of the Reformation, right? As Reformation and Enlightenment ideas creep in, more tolerance creeps in. There's an extreme to that. Obviously, the worst experience comes in a in Germany, right? So it's it's not a guarantee of security. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was hardly too much enlightenment. <laughs> right, so, but, it, but nor was it too much, right? Nor was it too much religion. The, uh, no, nor was it too much religion. The, it, none of these extremes work. It's not religion or not religion that's the mm -hmm. answer. It is religion that feels responsible to the highest callings within that faith. Uh, what the people around this table like would define as that as respect for others and, some, and an understanding that though there is a religion, some, by definition, I've understood that, well, we call on a higher authority than any of us can, the humility that comes with, but that comes through my own human understanding of it. Mm -hmm. um, so that there's a limit, because even though God asks this, there's a limit to what I can deliver on that because, because I could ultimately be wrong. And of course, without any doubt, for example, the, the Jewish experience in, um, in both the Christian and Muslim world, and, and it varied. Uh, Sir Martin Gilbert has just written a, a rather good book, I think, about the history of, 
of Jews and Islamic countries. And um, we, we tend to have a very CBC picture of, of history, and it's sort of rather simplistic and black and white. And it really did very great on who was in power, the economy, and, and, and all sorts of things. Um, while there was both good and bad treatment of the Jewish minority in Christian and Muslim majority states, the idea of extermination, which is part of eugenics and social engineering, is surely a child of, of the Enlightenment. If we think of the French Revolution, which was directly influenced by the great Enlightenment philosophers, mass slaughter, a, a complete group of people will have to disappear. Massacres, I mean, more, more people in two weeks of the Revolution than 30 years of the Inquisition. And surely then we, I think, that Stalin and Hitler are, are almost inevitable. We, if we knew this was going to happen. Isn't that a consequence of the absence of faith? So all people suffer, including Jews. It's, you could, it's, as I said, it's both and, right? So with faith, you have you have the risks of these extremist regimes that you find in Saudi Arabia and any number of places throughout history, right? Where the the power of the government is not restrained because they have a tapping on what God wants. In Enlightenment nations, as you say, like the slaughter has been greater since in secular nations, certainly in the 20th century, um, but that's a consequence more of the people misusing the ideas than it is of the ideas themselves. Because mm -hmm. Mao slaughtered millions in the name of equality doesn't mean that I think equality is a terrible thing. Because Stalin slaughtered millions in the name of moving the country forward <laughs> economically doesn't mean that economic progress is a terrible thing. Uh, because because you know, for, because there's rape doesn't mean sex a bad thing, right? It's it's the misusing of the idea. The same applies to religion. So religion can be misused, and religious ideas can be misused, uh, but. That doesn't make it a bad thing. It means that there are limits that have to be placed on, and those are best understood as um, the, what we understand as the ethical limits. That's, um, <coughs> that's very helpful. I'm reminded, in fact, as we left the TV uh, studio this afternoon, I was, uh, I was following uh, Justin out of the uh, car park, and you have a wonderful selection of bumper stickers on the back of your car, enough to make any evangelical uh, wince with it. <laughs> yeah. uh, one, of them, one of them in particular. By the way, just, just to let you know, uh, if the brakes seem a bit soft on the way home, <laughs> it wasn't me. It wasn't <laughs> but um, one of the ones that struck me um, was that you had this wonderful sticker that says science saves, and I chuckled and I thought that's very clever. And then I got to myself, myself thinking, and I thought that ties in very nicely with what you were saying, because actually science doesn't save, it can be used for good, it can be used for ill, anything can be. Uh, just a few, a few weeks ago, Christopher Hitchens debated um, my previous Prime Minister here in this country. We were very glad to get rid of him, at least for a, for a few weeks, to your wonderful country. Ooh, Hitchens and or... You, 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 say, you, may leave, you may decide which I meant. And, uh, but those of you who caught that debate will have, will have discovered, of course, that the thrust of Hitchens' um, argument on that night was the idea that religion poisons everything. That's the theme of his, his book, Religion Causes War, Religion Causes Intolerance, Religion Causes All These Things. And I sat there thinking, it's a very good argument, and he's a wonderful orator, but my conclusion at the end of the evening was you could have taken the word religion out of that argument and inserted politics. Po politics poisons everything. It causes division, it causes war, it causes tribalism. Money poisons everything. It causes envy, it causes crime. All of these things poison everything. What's the common element that actually is human beings? We can take anything, religion, politics, money, sex, and use it for good or for ill. Um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Russian novelist and commentator, once wrote a very famous line. He said the dividing line between good and evil runs right through the middle of every human heart. The problem is not religion or politics or money. The problem is us, and that's what we have to come to terms with. So how do we begin to, to live with one another? I think for me, the way we start that is conversations like this evening and honesty. And I think that means for all of us, whether we're secular, whether we're Christian, whether we're Jewish, uh, whatever we are, whether we're Muslim here this evening, that we face up to the times when we've been at our best and the times that we've been at our worst. And that includes each and every one of us. One of the things I admire about, uh, about yesterday today on the, on the television was your willingness to sort of grapple with some of the difficult issues. Uh, you mentioned Yusuf al Karadawi, a leading Muslim uh, voice theologian here in the world, and you were discussing the fact that you thought it would be wonderful if he took a firmer line, for example, on laws and apostasy. And I thought that's fantastic to hear a moderate Muslim voice, intelligent Muslim intellectual, say that. And I think all of us have to be, face our traditions with honesty, 
and as I say, that goes for each and every one of us, and really address those issues of the human heart. Excuse me, I'm sorry, Michael, can we do that? Through the chair. Yeah, I mean, I, I share the sentiments, uh, Andy, that, that you're elucidating there. I, I do want to return to my point. I do think that there is something uniquely malevolent in uh, the religious impulse, which is distinguished, which distinguishes it from politics or money or all these other uh, tools of our culture that can be used or abused. And I think it is that element of faith, that idea that at the core of this concept, whatever it is, there is something that is so sacred and so important to, to an individual, so significant to their identity, that it cannot be questioned, that it must be assumed. I mean, in, in each of your traditions, I understand that there are deep uh, spiritual conflicts that the community engages with. Um, uh, you had mentioned that uh, at the beginning, um, for example, in the Jewish tradition. But I still believe, having looked at those uh, sort of uh, uh, cultures and the way that they look at their own histories, that there's still some assumption that can't be questioned. Maybe it's the existence of God, maybe it's the Holy Trinity, I don't quite know in, in every tradition, but there is something there. And I think what, what I uh, favor about, say, secular humanism, which is the, not belief so much as worldview or even a methodology for living one's life and making uh, important decisions about uh, values and ethics and, and meaning and all that, is that I don't believe that there are necessarily assumptions. I believe that everything is open to question. If you take skepticism, we were talking about this before uh, we started the event, uh, to its radical conclusion, that would be radical skepticism, that would be skepticism of skepticism, skepticism of its own worldview. And I think that's a, that would be a very healthy position, unlike radical uh, Islam or radical Judaism, radical Christianity. You really can't have a radical skeptic, as I understand it, a properly um, uh, 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 skeptic that is, that is uh, applying skepticism uh, in, in its ideal way will have to even evaluate his or her own assumptions. And I think what's unique about secular humanism is that you know we've been talking a lot about how we have to understand with humility that our knowledge is limited and, and even if there's a God out there that, that we have to interpret that through a kind of human condition and that, that humility can be a, a check and a balance on, on extremism and on um, you know, dictatorships gone wild. But I think humanism is, is intelligent here because it, it's all about the human condition. It's looking at that condition with, with honesty and looking with reason and the tools of science uh, and compassion and ethics uh, at, what, at how we've evolved to be human beings and on what our limits are as, as human creatures. And I think if we understood that better, that the values that we build as a society would be you know, much better than the ones we have right now. Your key phrase there, Justin, is in its ideal way. Mm -hmm. that's, yes. that's the common yes. yes. All of it works in its ideal way. That's right. And I think, I think that's, you know, that's, uh, what's that, I think mean, that's the point that I'd like to make is, is we have to, you know, this, this sounds, in theory, it's very nice to say that because religion has this divine uh, standard uh, or divine reference or claims this divine reference, that it lends itself more to um, an exclusivist or a, or a dictatorial impulse. And I think the data belies that. If you look at human history, the worst excesses in human history by any measure that you choose, by any objective measure, whether it's the frequency or the number of victims or the brutality or the oppression or all of the, you know, they were anti-religion. The worst excesses in human history were not only, you know, separate from religion, they were anti-religion. Oh, yeah. All of the examples, I mean, the examples, if you talk about Mao, if you talk about Stalin, if you talk about, about Hitler, if you talk about any of these people, they were firmly uh, anti-religion. In what way was Hitler... Anti-religion. Oh, 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 oh. You can't see it. Show me all the ballots that Hitler was, was oh, Okay, um, just to refer you to, I, I just, so my book that comes out in April called White Catholics Are Right. There's a full there's a full chapter about this. Um, honestly, Justin, I, this I, and I, I get these emails from atheists. But you say he was pro-religion. I'm asking no, you, what way was he actually atheist well, or anti-religion? The, the ideology of national socialism, and if you read. Rosenberg, for example, one of the great Nazi ideologues. Um, if, if you look at some of the, the less published writings of, of Goebbels, uh, it's rather likely the Voltaire approach. Voltaire was an anti-Semite. He didn't actually hate Jews as such. He hated them for giving the world Christianity. 
if you, if you read the, the National Socialist writings in the late 1920s and early 1930s, a lot of them are quite embarrassed about the anti-Semitism, but they keep saying, we have to destroy the effeminate, weak Christianity that has destroyed Germanic and Teutonic culture, yes. and you gave it to us, so we have to attack you. There was a direct campaign. I mean, Hitler actually said, don't worry too much about the Catholic Church. We have to defeat it, but in the end, it'll just be a group of old women sitting there praying. It was committed to expunging Christianity. The SS culture was directly pagan. And Nazism, even in, small, and in some ways, I suppose, there was religiosity, but even in its most secular, believed that there were certain great world wars going on. One was between Aryans and Jews, and the other was with it, with, between Teutonic paganism and Christianity. And it, it's, it's one thing, I don't mean this about you, but it's one thing to watch war movies and simply understand Nazism. But it, there was a deliberate attempt uh, to take on Christianity in all of its aspects. Yes, there were some collaborators who really needed to be Christian, but we don't understand the evils of Nazism unless we understand what its primary aims were. Less of a case with Stalin. Stalin was a pragmatic murderer, a pragmatic fight. He killed anyone he thought was a threat to him, and that included Christians. And of course, there was, a, there was an officially atheist regime, they tried to destroy Christianity. But it's far more concentrated with national socialism. So the idea that um, where were they anti Christian? It's abundant. I just want to get a quick point in there and then I'll hand it over. You're picking and choosing a few deistic philosophers like Voltaire and a few SS officials who were anti-religious and, and you're, you're choosing some anti-Semitic statements that they said and you're saying the entire Nazi edifice was was built upon an, an anti-religious perspective. Right, not, yes. not, not just anti-Jewish, of course, but, but anti-religion generally. But of course, you know, you can name all sorts of, of no. devout Christians who were equally anti-Semitic throughout no. the Middle Ages who may have lent some I didn't say anti-religion. In fact, uh, there was little comment on Islam. I'm sure there would have been a war on Islam. But at the time, it was useful to use some Bosnian Muslims uh, and the Mufti in Jerusalem bad examples of Islam because there were many Muslims who died in the Palestinian Brigade and elsewhere fighting against the Nazis. But uh, I didn't say to religion, a war against Christianity. I, I'm not that suburban to take the odd quote here and there. The ideology of National Socialism, if you read the documents, is aggressively, obsessively anti-Christian. Yes. It believes that German culture was raped by weak need Christianity. Christianity believes in forgiving. National Socialism believed in dominating. As part of its legit political legitimacy, yes, I agree. But no, even the ideology was evidence an atheistic ideology. No, that it's based on the right human eugenics. Well, it is. I guess it's the old, it's the old adage of post hoc propter hoc, which you've gone to Catholic school, you would know. Are you not? And of course, would have been probably produced in a good, uh, rational sort of reality. I think one of the things to do is to step back a little bit and to understand that these are incredibly a nuanced kind of issues in one sense that one has to be humble before history. Mm -hmm. And history does not lend itself to one line sort of banners on the side of buses or on any or on pamphlets that are that are at the back of the churches or the synagogues or anywhere else. It's a much more complicated reality. And I think what the rabbi was saying, Rabbi Daniel, what you were saying is very important. The both and. I love hearing that because that's what Karl Barth called the damned Catholic and. It's not either or. It's not faith or reason. It's both. And it seems to me that faith that is not balanced by the understanding of and the importance of appealing to human reason, and that entails a wrestling with all of the consequences of that, is going to find itself completely and utterly in dangerous territory. But, to quote Joseph Pieper, reason has a wax nose. Reason itself, purely isolated from the fact that it's based on, a, that there is the possibility of intuitive, uh, intuitive uh, acts of, if you will, faith or commitment that undergird it to a larger sort of metaphysic or meta-narrative, even though in the postmodern world we're not supposed to talk about it, even the commitment not to talk about a meta-narrative is itself a meta-narrative. You know, when you've got all these sort of structures that are out there, you need the complementarity of both. My issue is in Canada, where we have the possibility of actually having folks like us sit at the front and have a conversation without any danger that afterwards we're going to be beat up, threatened. How do we model this? 
And it seems to me that one of the things that is a problem is that this kind of discussion has to happen in this place, in this way. I teach a course in, in philosophy of religion, and the point that I try and make to my students is, because we're all kinds of background, the atheists all sit at the back, because they got there before the Catholics got there who wanted to sit at the back. We've got the, the evangelicals over here. Uh, at the front, I remember my first uh, class, there was a, a, uh, a gay Wiccan whose hair color would change every week, sitting next to a beautiful woman in a Shador, sitting next to one of my Jewish students. And I said, look at folks, here's a picture of Canada. And it's a religious picture. So we've got to figure out how we in here can converse as friends. And two things I want to exclude that I think are constantly part of the rhetoric. Number one is the idea that for Canada as a community and a society to exist, we have to ban religion and its discussion from the public discourse and say freedom of religion means freedom to think your own religious thoughts but not freedom to be religious, number one. And number two is the thought that somehow all religions are the same. Yeah. I mean, which is really, really offensive. And so somehow, given this, we have to move beyond even the ism of, of, uh, of pluralism to a sense of plurality. And how is it that you have this kind of discourse? I would kind of argue, actually, that secularity is something that broke into the world historically through Christian reflection that decoupled the world from a theocratically functioning reality. In other words, that this, this civilization had within itself and its own integrity that didn't require a pope running it. And you say, well, come on, look at history. Now if you look at its deep impulses, why is it that in the West, if you look at the 8th century, why is it if you look at the three different cultures, you had the Islamic culture, the Byzantine culture, and the European, the Western European culture, and you were going to say, pick one that's going to produce man on the moon. You would have said Islam, the Islamic culture. You would never have picked those hoods and thugs that were in, in Western Europe. Why? I think it had something to do with monasticism in a funny way. This kind of freedom of thought that went on that was freed from ecclesiastical control and also free from, uh, and from political control that allowed, if you will, the kind of secularity that birthed the best part of Torah and Enlightenment, but maybe stood over against with a kind of a humility that the Enlightenment never had, thinking that somehow reason on its own would be able to solve all of humanity's ills. And I just look at the carnage of the century past, and I say, there should be a little bit more reflection going on here. I'll take, you know, we have to look and see where, where there was irrationality in the religious tradition when it was decoupled from reason and its reflection. But so too does reason have to realize that faith is not malevolent. I don't think faith is malevolent because if you think that, then there's a deep self-hatred that could possibly come there because at some point you're going to make an intuitive commitment. Last point that we're going to do. Okay, good. So the, other, the last point that I'll try to make here is, I mean, I think we would have a long, uh, hopefully fruitful discussion about uh, why we think uh, certain the scientific discoveries happened where. Yeah. Uh, I really, I, and again, I, I'm very hesitant when we make arguments of inevitability based on theology. And, and, that, and in theology, I include skepticism and atheism, uh, because those are theologies in their own right. And I really think we have to understand that if, if we... Uh, predicate anything at all on the assumption that we can resolve the theological discussion in favor of one opinion or another, then we're going nowhere. Yes. Really, the discussion has to come back to those fundamental values that we share pre-religion, prior to any, and I include, as I said, you know, atheism and skepticism are religions in that sense. So, regardless of what it is that I believe to be true, you're absolutely right. We cannot present a world in which, okay, well, you know, it's all equal, it's all the same, you believe what you want. We have to have a world in which we argue for what we believe to be true, because that is how we learn from each other. That is how I discover more about my faith in talking to you, is by arguing that what I believe is true. Uh, but, but in the, that argument, we have to be able to have that argument while respecting the fundamental values right, that are shared across. Okay, uh, now you guys are going to do some work. <laughs> We're going to take questions from the floor, and who will be the brave soul to put their hand up first? Hello, sir. It doesn't have to be on the same topic. Yes, you can be any topic at all in, in the, the, the range of...
terms of how faith in public life could help or hinder the presence of some sort of means of coming to an agreement on what can be publicly enacted. Okay. I just had to ask you one question before we proceed. Who, do you, who would you suggest gave the world science and, and the urge to achieve scientific discovery? What makes you think who is the right question? Well, okay, I, I, I'm not sure if you answered it because, for example, there was no written culture within the Celtic peoples. It was only when Roman Catholicism, Christianity came to Europe, people wrote things down. Uh, science was, uh, was virtually ignored by, by pagan cultures. Um, the Roman Catholic Church was a handmaiden of science. Uh, if we think of you know, Father Copernicus, in modern times we think about the Big Bang Theory, we think about uh, genetics, uh, um, uh, we think about in the Protestant uh, culture, we think about Isaac Newton. Um, people tend to mention Galileo. You know they can never spell Galileo when they say that because as I'm sure you know, in fact, his private sponsor being the man who became the Pope, it was, wasn't his son, so one objected to it, but his theology that got him into some sort of trouble. But I, so I, I think that the, the church is a handling of science, and, and the same can be said, uh, and certainly of Islam, uh, some parts of its history, that the great monotheistic religions were eager to give us science. They never held it back, they encouraged it. So I don't believe there's any contradiction between them in science and religion. Now, your, your, your question, um, which, by the way, is what is often suggested today, that you're either scientific or you're religious. It's simply not the case. Now, in the public sphere, so you're, what you're really asking is, what is enacted? Do you mean by, in terms of legislation and how we live? In terms of what should be considered by legislators. Right. Mm. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Can I make a start on that? I'll, I'll uh, throw my hat into the ring and the rest of you can uh, proceed to trample all over it. I, mean, I think you're right, it's something you hear, you hear very often, this idea that only science is the, is the truly neutral observer science because it's rooted in the, in the empirical method and observation because of the, the process of testing and self-correction, therefore science is the arbiter of everything. The problem, the problem is, at the end of the day, if you read any philosopher of science who knows their, uh, who knows their discipline will tell you that science is extremely good at the, at the what questions, it's not so good at the why questions. So, you know, to put it bluntly, science will tell you what will happen if we wire Michael's chair to the mains and, uh, and send 3,000 volts through him. But science cannot, cannot tell me whether or not I should do that. Uh, law might tell me what will happen to me afterwards, but science alone can't answer that question. Science, quite frankly, is metaphysically neutral. It doesn't answer those kind of ethical questions. It doesn't answer those kind of metaphysical questions, which is interesting with something that Justin said a moment ago. Uh, Justin said it's all about the worldview, and I agree with him entirely. When it comes to science, it's all about the worldview. We can look at, we can use science to determine what's happening with global warming, but then politics and ethics and finance and all kinds of other questions come into go, well, what do we do with that information? Because the problem is, at the end of the day, science, I don't think, really does answer those deep questions of the human condition. Ultimately, at the end of the day, if you're purely a naturalist, you can't get away from the fact that you and I, you and I are each a bag of chemicals. And science can't really tell us well, why bags of chemicals should respect one another. Interestingly, one of my favorite atheists... I, I respect you, I think you're uh, splendid. One of my, fa one of my favorite atheists <laughs> at the moment is, um, is, Sam, is Sam Harris. Sam Harris, the one of the new atheists. Because I think what's interesting, if you've you read Sam Harris's new book, The Moral Landscape, Harris recognizes this problem. That entire book is written to try and solve the grounding problem, as it's called in ethics. And most reviewers, be they Christian, Jewish, Muslim, or secular, go, he fails entirely. But I take my hat off, I'll take it back out of the ring and take it off again, and tip it to Harris that he does at least recognize there's a problem there. Um, so to return to what does religion offer, I think what we need in a country like Canada or where I come from in Europe is we need a plurality of voices at the table to recognise that science, whichever other tool we bring to the table, is never going to be enough on its own. So we have to listen to each other, and science is one of those voices. I equally have as, I have as little time for someone who wants to advance science and push religion out as I do for some of my religious friends who say there's no place for science. I have no time for that whatsoever. We need all tools and all voices at the table. But um, one, one of the rest of the panel, maybe we should check in. I'm sure, I'm sure Justin probably wants to. Well, there's so much to pick up on there. Um, but just to jump on immediately with what you just said, I, I do agree. I don't think science on its own can make the, uh, the value or meaning 
decisions about what's important in our life and, and how we ought to make moral choices and all that. Um, but, but I think you're maybe downplaying the importance of science, and I think um, the way the question was, was phrased suggests that by science you don't just mean what happens in the laboratory, but the scientific method more generally used. And it's this thirst for knowledge and this idea that no idea is, is sacred, everything can be falsified, or fa everything is potentially falsifiable, we should conduct, if not laboratory experiments in the physics or chemistry sense, then, then uh, uh, experiments in society building to find out what makes people uh, live and, and uh, flourish better together, that science can help us understand the human condition, human psychology, what makes people happy. It doesn't mean we should have scientific experiments in laboratories like for education. I said not like the laboratory, oh, but, ah, but I think that testing out different laws and different principles uh, through, through parliaments and through, uh, through different legal systems, I think that, that is in fact what happens. We have different countries and they, they enact slightly different laws and then we, we often look at which ones work better and other jurisdictions might